All right, we're starting off here, chapter two, going to look at the comedian and try to understand what's going on in this chapter. Um, particularly, the guiding question was, why is the comedian an appropriate title for Edward Blake, given all the horrific and evil things that he does? Clearly, he is a character that is not particularly funny in terms of his actions or his words. Um, and so the question that we should be asking on a deeper level is why is he called the comedian? Um, and we're even kind of clued into this, uh, this, this contrast, this disconnect between his name and his actions in the opening, sorry, in the opening image here, right? We get a statue and obviously the rain is falling, but visually it looks as if the statue is crying, um, a good symbol of, of sadness or despair, perhaps. Um, one other thing, lots of little Easter eggs throughout this, but you can see this blimp in the upper right-hand corner. Keep an eye out for more, uh, for, for any clues about uh, blimps or airships within this novel. No, the world is a little different than our own, thanks to Dr. Manhattan. You can see another one uh, way up here in the upper right-hand corner. Um, let's keep going. So we are at a cemetery, uh, and notice right off the bat, again, this layering of text over images in ways where the author, where Alan Moore is juxtaposing or contrasting um, images in, in interesting ways or juxtaposing the text over the image. So right here, obviously, this dialogue um, that begins the chapter is from uh, Lori talking with her mom. Um, and she says, her mom, Sally, says, so honey, what brings you to the city of the dead? Now, that text is imposed over this image of the cemetery, which is quite literally a place of the dead. But then that is juxtaposed or contrasted with the very sunny and bright California, right? So the true city of the dead, Los Angeles, seems very bright and colorful. The uh, more figurative city of the dead, the cemetery on the left here, um, obviously a lot more gloomy. Um, and so we keep on going here, and you can see they don't necessarily have a great relationship. Um, and uh, notice the other little clues of the apocalyptic fervor kind of going on here. The end is nigh guy is coming on in. Um, and what's odd about Sally's reaction to the news that um, Edward Blake died is that she seems uh, to pity him in some way. And her, and her mom is surprised by that. Um, or Sorry, Lori is surprised. She says, I'd never forgive somebody who did that, dot, dot, dot. And then Sally says, listen. Getting old, you get a different perspective. The big stuff looks smaller somehow. In the end, you wash your hands of it and shut it all away. And notice the focus of this image here. You can see hands being washed by the rain. And what are the hands holding? A sign that says the end is nigh. Um, so it, it, it is uh, kind of paralleling what's going on in the text here. In the end, uh, paralleled with the end is nigh, you just wash your hands of it in the same way that this person's hands are being washed um, and being shut away, so on and so forth. So the way that we're going to go about this, we're going to see different flashbacks um, about the comedian, and we're going to try to understand what the comedian is going for here. Um, my main argument is going to be that the comedian is titled the, to the comedian because he is trying to expose what a joke people's values are, especially their moral values, their claims to moral clarity. That fantasy that I was talking about in the first chapter is very relevant in the comedian's mind. And we, we will have to try to understand how he critiques implicitly each of the characters and their underlying values through his own actions. So he's not a comedian because he's funny. He's a comedian because his performance is about exposing people's values as a joke. And what do I mean by a joke? A joke is something that is not to be taken seriously, something to be laughed at. So he's not the funny one. The reason he's the comedian is because he's exposing uh, what should be laughable about other people. And, and so that's what makes him the comedian. And so we got to start with Sally Jupiter, um, which is certainly one of the most problematic ones. Um, everything I'm going to describe in this chapter about the comedian is not to justify his actions. Clearly, his response to the world is that of nihilism, the idea that no moral values have any worth and thus there is no action to be affirmed, right? Um, and instead, you can do anything. If any of you have read Grendel, um, this should immediately parallel with what's going on within that text, when Grendel encounters the dragon and after that point um, becomes fully nihilistic and thus free to commit any atrocity. We can intellectually understand where the comedian is coming from, even if we do not affirm his particular actions. And clearly we're going to see his actions are, are deeply and profoundly problematic. 
So let's keep going here. Um, let's go to the next page, and we see here uh, all of the old superhero gang are, are bunched together here. Um, and uh, let's see. To do this page, we get a little bit more insight into Sally Jupiter, um, Lori's mother. So she says in this upper right-hand corner, you remember the guy who writes me letters? Well, he sent me an item of memorabilia. And Lori says, the one who asked your old costume for your old costume? Honestly, Mom, you encourage these guys. What is it? It's a Tijuana Bible, says uh, Sally, a little eight-page porno comic they did in the 30s and 40s. They did them about newspaper funnies, characters like Blondie, even real people like Mae West. This one's about me. About, oh God, Mother, this is just gross. Somebody sent this to you? Sure, listen, these things are valuable, like antiques, 80 bucks and up. I think it's kind of flattering. And you can see here, this is a pornographic comic. Flattering, says Lori. Being reminded that people used to slobber over me? Sure, flattering. Why not? Lori, I'm 65. Every day the future looks a little bit darker. But the past, even the grimy parts of it, well, it all just keeps getting brighter all the time. So right off the bat, we should be uh, trying to use our detective brains, our analytical brains, to figure out what's going on here. Um, and we find out, I, I think the clues that really tie this all together are the clues we'll see in the end chapter excerpt from Hollis Mason. We'll find out that the whole way the Minutemen, the first banding of superheroes, even got together was actually because of Sally Jupiter, this woman. And the reason is because she had a PR agent who was trying to get a group together to increase uh, Sally Jupiter's publicity to further her modeling career. So right off the bat, we find out, or I guess not right off the bat, but at the end of the chapter, we find out that Sally Jupiter's intentions um, for becoming a superhero were not about trying to impose good versus evil or trying to bring justice um, to the world. Rather, it was about furthering her modeling career. And I think we can connect what's going on with that modeling career and her reaction here to this pornographic comic as being similar in a certain way. Um, Sally ultimately was about trying to promote her body in a very physical sense. Sense. And so what is, what is she about? She is about, uh, about furthering a, a sense of objectification. Um, now we're going to see the connection here with the comedian in just a second. And obviously there's no way to defend what the comedian does. But certainly I, I would argue that the comedian is trying to expose the way in which Sally Jupiter's underlying intentions being about objectification, trying to um, make people like her for her body, ultimately are shallow. That there is not much substance there. And he proves the ultimate, um, the the conclusion of that very cynical thought uh, through his actions in this scene. And so you can see here, um, he tries to assault her. And as he comes in, she says, Eddie, what the hell are you doing here? You knew I was changing. And he says, sure, I did. You announced it loud enough. And so the comedian is, is implicitly arguing that Sally Jupiter ultimately has no deeper values beyond an objectification of her own body. Her ultimate desire is to have people value her for her physical looks. And so the comedian is exposing how shallow she ultimately is through his horrific actions. Again, not to justify them. Clearly, these are indefensible, um, but to understand uh, what the comedian is going for here. Uh, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Um, do, do, do. And Lori here ties it all together. She says, mother, this is vile. I'm, I just, geez, I just don't know how you can stand being degraded like this. I mean, don't you care how people see you, mother? And notice she was so lost in reminiscing about this past, even though it was horrific in a certain way, she ultimately still affirms it because it was a moment in which people truly valued her for her body, as opposed to now, um, where clearly her aged and withered body means that she is not the object of sexual attraction anymore. Um, and Lori says, I said, doesn't this sleazeball image bother you? Honestly, mother, you, why do you only call me mother, says Sally, when you're mad? Anyway, what about your image? At least I don't sleep with an H-bomb. And Lori says, John is not an H-bomb. And Sally responds, honey, the only difference is that they didn't have to get the H-bomb laid every once in a while. Uh-huh, right, I see. Of course, you realize you're being totally unfair. And look at her. She says, yeah, well, things are tough all over, Cupcake, and it rains on the just and the unjust alike, except in California. 
And obviously what it means, it rains on the just and the unjust alike, she's saying misfortune happens to both good and bad people, but obviously this transitions to quite literal rain um, on the cemetery over um, the unjust individual of Eddie Blake. Also notice here in the background, right, Sally Jupiter, what does she decide to decorate her room with? It's full of old images of her, um, emphasizing again her, her physical image over other attributes. Let's keep going. Um, and for the rest of the chapter, the way the chapter is organized is via this sermon by a priest um, at the funeral for Edward Blake. And notice that each part of the sermon sets up on a thematic level the idea that will be relevant within the flashback that ensues. Um, so let's see here. Priest says, man that is born of woman hath but a short time to live and is full of miseries. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. He fleeth as if it were a shadow and never continueth in one stay. In the midst of life, we are in death. Of whom may we seek succor but of thee, O Lord, who for our sins are justly displeased. So you should be asking yourself, what is the thematic idea that's being communicated here by the priest? Um, and it is, if you, if you take a look at it, it's about the fragility of life. We have but a short time to live. Our life is full of miseries. We cometh up and are cut down like a flower. A flower is a good symbol of something that is fragile and temporary, something that wilts or dies very quickly. Um, and we flee as if it were a shadow, as if all life were, were a brief shadow and we never continueth. And it, this line, in the midst of life, we are in death. Always when we are alive, we are, uh, we are in the midst of death. We could die at any point. Um, one of the French existentialists wrote that as soon as we are born, we are old enough to die. Um, and that's the idea that's being communicated here. So let's see how this uh, idea of death or the inevitability of death or the fragility of life plays in here. Um, so we, we, uh, we now understand the comedian's critique of Sally Jupiter. Let's understand his critique of this second group, the Crime Busters. Um, so this was the second gathering of superheroes after the Minutemen. And let's hear Captain Metropolis. And my argument is going to be that Captain Metropolis very much embodies that fantasy of moral clarity that I was discussing in the first chapter. He says, for those of you who only know me as Captain Metropolis, the name's Nelson Gardner. Call me Nelson. Third, uh, I guess I should welcome everybody to the first ever meeting of the Crime Busters. So you can see everybody here. These are all the characters we are going to learn about um, and, and mainly focus on within this uh, graphic novel. Notice the comedian's reaction. He is sitting there burping. He also has his head in a paper, the headline being French Withdraw, Military Commitment from NATO. Um, so he seems to be more focused on international affairs, which will be a theme that we'll see uh, brought up again and again, whereas these people are about busting crime. And he says, why the crime busters? Well, as you know, this country hasn't had an organization of mass adventurers since the Minutemen disbanded in 49. Specialized law enforcement is standing still. Crime isn't. New social evils emerge every day. Promiscuity, drugs, campus subversion, you name it. Now, by banding together as the crime busters, by the way, before we get to the comedian's bit here, Notice uh, this connects very much to the idea that I was talking about in the last chapter about the origins of the superhero genre um, being very much these kind of traditional patriotic values. And if you were to go look at comics from the 50s and 60s, you would see all these characters like this, um, like Spider-Man slinging in, um, telling kids to not do drugs, to go study, to not be protesting, so on and so forth, um, to be waiting uh, to have any sort of sexual interaction until they're married, so like, et cetera, et cetera. And these values, um, the idea of like, let's go around in, in these spandex costumes and beat up on these criminals who are doing these subversive things, um, and we can thus make the world a better place, the comedian is going to call bullshit. He is going to call out this fantasy for what it is. Um, and Nelson Gardner says, what? And the comedian, who is stretching across multiple panels here, I said bullshit. This whole idea, this crime buster shtick, it stinks. What is it, Nelly? Is it that you're getting old and you want to go on playing Cowboys and Indians? Obviously, Cowboys Indians, uh, a game that little children would be playing, right? Simplistic notions of good and evil. Clearly, he is accusing Nelson here of having childish or naive values. That isn't true. Uh, listen, let's not throw the idea out right away. Me and Rorschach, says Night Owl, have made headway into the gang problem by pooling our efforts. Rorschach, notice, by the way, Rorschach's bubble, word bubble here, is not like it is in the first chapter. 
Um, and the reason we're going to find out is because he hasn't become fully Rorschach yet. We'll find out in Chapter 6, his origin story, the moment that he says actually birthed the true version of Rorschach. And it's after that moment that he gets those uh, squiggly um, uh, word dialogue bubbles. Obviously, I agree. Notice also he's using the pronoun, first-person pronoun, I. But a group this size seems more like a publicity exercise somehow. It's too big and unwieldy. Vite or Ozymandias says, surely that's just an organizational problem. With the right person coordinating the group, I think. Oh, and I wonder who that would be, says the comedian. Got any ideas, Ozzy? I mean, you are the smartest guy in the world, right? It doesn't require genius to see that America has problems that need tackling, uh, replies Vite. Damn straight, says the comedian. And it takes a moron to think they're small enough for clowns like you guys to handle. What's going down in this world, you got no idea. Believe me. And Vite uh, responds with, Why well, I think I'm as well-informed as anyone. Given correct handling, none of the world's problems are insurmountable. All it takes is a little intelligence. So Vite is responding, comedian saying, This is a joke if you guys think you can actually um, solve the world's problems. Vite says, Hey, if we just have um, some good intelligence, some good organization, we can actually make some headway into these problems. And comedian says, Which you got in spades, right? You people are a joke. Hey, there's a key line to get to the uh, core idea, the core thesis of the comedian. He thinks people are a joke in terms of whenever they uh, do, whenever they do not shy away from the truths of existence and instead try to retreat into these fantasies of moral values. You hear Moloch's back in town and think, "Oh boy, let's gang up and bust him." You think that matters? You think that solves anything? Notice Rorschach, who is always adamant about needing to punish evil, bring evil to justice, says, "Well, of course it matters." And comedian says it don't matter, squat. Here, let me show you why it don't matter. Hey, what are you doing, says Nelson. And comedian says it don't matter, squat, because inside 30 years, the nukes are going to be flying like Maybugs. Nelson's like, my display. And then Ozzy here is going to be the smartest man on the cinder. Now, pardon me, but I got an appointment. See you in the funny papers. Obviously, a reference to the obituary, which is right next to the comics, something that you guys probably don't have much experience with because who gets newspapers in 2020? Um, what is the comedian's argument? Clearly, it is about the impotence or the powerlessness of individuals in the face of larger um, impersonal forces, more particularly that of federal governments with nuclear weapons. Think about it. The, the, go back to the Greek stories where there were just these small island nations um, and the idea of one individual like Achilles being this vast, powerful soldier who could do so much and sway the tide of battle could perhaps make sense. Individuals mattered then. They had more power. They had more agency. In a world like we live in in 2020, how much power does one individual really have, um, especially to implement good or justice in a world in which countries have nuclear weapons? Clearly not much. And so I think the comedian is, is critiquing one of those core assumptions of the superhero genre or just people who want to fight crime in general, um, which, is that, which is that individuals have power to change the world. Um, and clearly he is, he is cynical about that. Instead, the comedian, right, chooses to be an agent for this large and personal force, the U.S. federal government, because he believes that is what leads to change. Now, he doesn't think the U.S. federal government is good. As we'll see, he chooses to become a parody of what the U.S. federal government is doing by going and burning villages in Vietnam um, and killing children in Vietnam. Um, but we can see here where the comedian's ultimate, uh, what his ultimate stance is, which is that going around and beating up criminals in New York City does nothing to change the atomic situation, which is the most likely scenario for human extinction. Um, you also have to appreciate this text being written in the 1980s. The Cold War was still raging. Um, the threat of nuclear annihilation had been looming, looming very heavily over humanity's conscience for about 30 years at this point. Let's keep going. Um, we continue the sermon. It says, O Lord, most mighty, O holy, and most merciful Savior, deliver us not into the bitter pains of eternal death. So we're getting a transition. Now it's not about death. Now it's about merciful Lord. And it says, Thou knowest, Lord, the secrets of our hearts. Shut not thy merciful eyes to our prayers, but spare us, Lord, most holy, O God, most mighty, O holy and merciful Savior. Thou, most worthy judge eternal, suffer us not at our last hour for any pains of death to fall from thee. 
So, okay, this parallel should be pretty easy, guys. Um, this is clearly about asking whether God, the force um, that uh, that has uh, more power than anything else within the universe, whether that God will be merciful um, on our souls. Will God have mercy? Obviously, it's zooming up on Dr. Manhattan here because Dr. Manhattan is the closest thing we have to God within the universe of Watchmen. Um, he is clearly the one with the powers that make him very godlike. And let's see what the comedian is doing here. Um, they had just won, we find out, alternate history. America won the Vietnam War thanks to, uh, thanks to Dr. Manhattan. Um, and let's see what he says. Comedian says, if we'd lost this war, I don't know, it might have driven us a little crazy, you know, as a country. Obviously, notice the tongue-in-cheek joke here. Uh, it did drive America a little bit crazy. That was probably the greatest uh, point of social unrest since the Civil War. But thanks to you, we didn't, right? Down a hatch. You sound bitter. You're a strange man, Blake, says Dr. Manhattan. You have strange attitudes to life and war. Strange, says the comedian. Listen, once you figure out what a joke everything is, being the comedian's the only thing makes sense. Again, that's another good uh, piece of evidence we have to fit into my thesis about comedian's key point is that everything is a joke. What does he mean by that? Again, the idea that values um, are not meant to be taken seriously. And he says his reaction is that this that nihilism basically is the only logical response to what a joke everything in, within the world is. It's the only logical response once you see the world for what it is. Look at Dr. Manhattan. He says... The charred villages, the boys with necklaces of human ears, these are part of the joke. And the comedian says, I never said it was a good joke. I'm just playing along with the gag. So yeah, the comedian is not, he's not saying this is great. He's not like, hey, I love, I love the fact that humanity is so violent and depraved. But he's saying, look, if you dispel all these pretenses, all the illusions that mankind uh, wears on a daily basis in terms of their being good, uh, that humanity is compassionate and not uh, depraved and evil and violent, um, then of course, then of course you can see that beneath all of that, um, there is a terrible core of humanity. Let's keep going. We can see uh, Nixon is coming here, um, and this is what will lead him to be reelected four times within the world of Watchmen. Um, and then as he's about to leave, you can see uh, this woman comes in, and, and comedian says, oh, great, oh, thank you, God, that's just what I needed. She says, now war is over, Mr. Eddie, now I must talk with you. Now, what is she talking about? What has she got in her belly? A nice, dank bowl of pho? Um, unfortunately, not. It's clearly he impregnated her, um, and he says he's going to leave, and she says, you're going to walk away from this. She says, but me, I cannot a walk, oh, not walk away from what grows in my belly. I cannot forget. And the comedian says, well, that's unfortunate, because that's just what I'm going to do. Forget you, forget your cruddy little country, all of it. As he says that, she gets the bottle, smashes it, hits him across the face, and as he's bleeding out, he ends up getting the gun. Dr. Manhattan says, Blake, Blake, don't. And then he shoots her down, uh, a woman he impregnated. Obviously quite horrific here. And so let's see what his critique of Dr. Manhattan. He says, Blake, she was pregnant. You gunned her down. And the comedian says, yeah, yeah, that's right. Pregnant woman gunned her down, bang. And you know what? You watch me. You could have changed the gun into steam or the bullets into mercury or the bottle into snowflakes. You could have teleported either of us to goddamn Australia, but you didn't lift a finger. You don't really give a damn about human beings. I've watched you. You never cared about what's her name, Janie Slater, even before you ditched her. Soon you won't be interested in Sally Jupiter's little gal either. You're drifting out of touch, Doc. You're turning into a flake. God help us all. So notice that echoing of what the uh, priest was saying just a couple pages before about uh, asking God to have mercy upon our souls. Um, the same idea is being communicated here, that Dr. Manhattan seems so detached emotionally from humanity, seems unable to relate to humanity in any way, shape, or form, that the closest thing we have to a God within this world clearly seems um, detached. And we will explore that on a thematic level much more in chapter three and chapter four, uh, this question of the odyssey or the problem of evil and trying to reconcile that with the existence of God. Um, notice as well, right, 
the comedian clearly was working on behalf of the U.S. federal government doing horrific actions. Vietnam War was not a proud moment for America, uh, particularly because many of the things that we were doing in that war were seen as horrific. We were napalming villages using um, very destructive bombs to burn down villages, even of innocents, because tracking down and killing the Viet Cong was so difficult. Um, and so the comedian, right, is parroting or, or he, is, he, is, he is embodying the amorality of the world or the immorality of the world, the underlying savageness. The United States would like to believe that they have moral superiority um, in all affairs, but, but strip it down, right? We, we engage in morally questionable actions, whether it's torture, whether it's burning villages, so on and so forth. Nobody is innocent. Uh, nobody is not implicated in what the comedian would see as humanity's inner depravity. Let's keep going. Sermon. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother here departed, we therefore commit his body into the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So the, these are lines that we have analyzed before um, about the insignificance or temporariness of human, of human existence. These are lines that God says when he communicates to us that uh, we have betrayed his rules in the Garden of Eden and from dust we are created and to dust we shall return. This is about humbling us in terms of our temporary life here on earth, about our ultimate insignificance. And we can see this on being paralleled here on the eve of the superheroes being outlawed. They are temporary. They, their existence as vigilantes um, is also just as temporary and mortal as our, our, as our lives. And so um, we have found out that this protest is over the existence of vigilantes in general, actually. Uh, they, do no, they no longer want vigilantes going around, and the U.S. federal government ends up passing the Keene Act, which outlaws the superheroes. Um, so again, a very different world than what we're used to in the superhero comics. We don't usually expect the federal government to pass actual legislation um, and the people to be protesting to this degree um, in ways that influence the world uh, of, a, of a fantasy superhero comic. So we can see the two different approaches here. Night Owl is obviously um, very apologetic for what's going on here. He's begging the people to stop, whereas the comedian seems to relish in what's going on here. And hopefully you can see uh, the, the, the real hate um, that's going on, that's being directed at the vigilantes from the people, right? They call him a pig and a rapist. They say, we don't want vigilantes, we want regular cops. And the comedian seems to take pleasure in throwing tear gas on them um, and shooting bullets at, or shooting rubber bullets at them. Um, Night Owl says in this middle panel, comedian, this is a nightmare. The whole city is erupting. How long can we keep this up? And again, the comedian relishing this, enjoying this says, ha, look at him. Run, you suckers. Comedian, I said, I heard what you said. My government contacts tell me some new act is being herded through. Until then, we're society's only protection. We have to keep it up as long as we have to. Protection, says Night Owl. Who are we protecting them from? You can see the emptiness here. Um, clearly what you should be thinking, right? It seems as if the people need protection from the comedian. So what is the comedian saying here? Well, who do the people need protection from? And we'll, and we'll get it in just a minute. Um, notice this newspaper in the lower left-hand corner that says cops say let them do it. Senator King prepares emergency bill. So the cops are protesting and the people are protesting on, on behalf of the cops um, for them to be able to do their jobs without, uh, without the interference of vigilantes. Um, and the comedian says from themselves, what's the matter? Don't you feel comfortable unless you're up against some schmuck in a Halloween suit? Speaking of which, where the hell are Rorschach and the others? John and Lori, says Night Owl, are handling the riots in Washington. Rorschach's across town trying to hold the Lower East Side. He, uh, he works mostly on his own these days. Rorschach's nuts, says the comedian. He's been nuts ever since that kidnapping he handled three years back. Again, keep an eye out for that kidnapping, which clearly seemed to change Rorschach's uh, mental well-being um, in Chapter 6. Him, Byron Lewis, John goddamn walking H-bomb Osterman, all nuts. And Night Owl says, but not you? Comedian says, nah, not me. I keep things in proportion and try to see the funny side. Then he yells, drop that can, you little freak. Ah, you see this? I've seen that written up all during these last two weeks. They don't like us and they don't trust us. So this is where we get the title of the graphic novel from, Who Watches the Watchmen? 
I would say the greatest uh, misconception about the novel is that the superheroes are called the Watchmen. They're actually never referred to as the Watchmen throughout the novel at all um, by themselves. Their, their group is not called the Watchmen. They're called, I guess, the Crime Busters or before that, the Minutemen. Um, but this line comes from a Roman author um, writing to, to critique the idea of absolute power in the form of the uh, Caesar. And uh, if we get more specific, right, think about what is it asking? Who watches the person who is supposed to be watching us? It's, a, it's about accountability for the person who has absolute power. Who watches the person who implements the rules? Who watches the person um, who sets the laws? So on and so forth. Um, this is about the dangers of unchecked power, which obviously connects to the vigilantes who are operating above the law, who have no one to really hold them in line if they do anything bad. Um, this whole situation, says Night Owl, it's terrible, it's horrible. And the comedian says, and this is what reveals everything we need to know, he says, well, me, I kind of like it when things get weird, you know? I like it when all the cards are on the table. So what is he referring to here? Uh, it's a game of poker, and you should think on a figurative level, what are games of poker figuratively associated with? What ideas are essential to that game? It's, it's all about lies and bluffs and deceptions. It's about pretenses and illusions. It's about trickery and deception. Um, and so what is the comedian's argument in this passage? Um, it's that once you put the cards on the table, that's the point in a poker game where everybody finally reveals what their hand was the entire time, and you find out uh, what, what was actually beneath those lies, those illusions, those pretenses, those bluffs. You find out the truth. Um, and go back up here to the upper left-hand corner, the comedian's argument that what are they protecting them from? It's from themselves. The comedian's ultimate argument here is that humanity is so depraved and prone to violence that they need violent force to keep them in line. That if you get rid of the police, if you get rid of something to keep humanity in check, that they won't join hands and sing kumbaya and create some utopian society. No, they will instead almost immediately descend into violence. Um, a good thought experiment, right? If, if, all the police tomorrow and the military and the government were to disappear, just poof, gone. Um, National Guard, poof, gone. Firefighters, gone. Uh, what do you think would happen? Do you think humanity would figure out some way to coexist peacefully? Or do you think that they would descend almost immediately into animalistic savagery and barbarity? Um, if, your question, if your answer to that question is the latter, if you believe that fundamentally beneath all of the lies and pretenses we have, um, there is an inner savagery um, that the only thing that keeps us from being horrific is the threat of a police officer shooting us with a gun, um, then you actually share many of the same views as the comedian. And thus, you could come to the conclusion that the comedian's coming to that all moral values are a joke because they create these lies and pretenses that humanity is better than they are. Um, again, this is pretty pretty paralleled with what goes on in, in the text Grendel, um, once Grendel becomes a nihilist and begins killing people, um, and also pretty well paralleled with uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness and Apocalypse Now, where Kurtz becomes this figure who has penetrated the truth of the human existence, um, that we are violent and depraved, and thus anything, any transgression becomes possible. What does Night Owl say? He says, but the country's disintegrating. What's happened to America? What's happened to the American dream? And the comedian says, it came true. You're looking at it. So he's playing on the idea of dream here. In order for the dream to exist, you must be asleep. What the comedian means when he says it came true, you're looking at it, is you actually have woken up from that illusion. You're actually seeing the dream for what it was. It was just a dream. That that was a fantasy, the idea um, to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and create this uh, morally virtuous nation. Um, what you actually see here is a nation that is predicated on force and violence, which is what the comedian is. He says, um, and, and so now we return ourselves to the sermon, um, and it asks, it ends on a note of asking for mercy, right? Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. It ends with an Our Father, um, which is developing, I think, a second theme of this, which is whether redemption is possible for those who commit evil, right? Um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Um, this clearly linked back to the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, 
chapter with uh, Sally Jupiter seeming to forgive uh, the comedian or at least uh, reminisce on that event in a much rosier way than we would typically expect. Um, and then let's continue, and it will continue here with Moloch, um, who we see looking kind of shady here. Um, originally, we might think that that was Rorschach because he's kind of wearing that same gear, but we'll find out in just a second that this was actually Moloch, who was uh, one of the comedian's enemies. So even his enemy has forgiven um, the comedian, it seems, despite his horrific actions. Um, and then this final note, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we'll see in just a moment here how the comedian... Um, seems to have turned to this uh, begging for forgiveness, begging to be delivered from evil in his final moments um, in this flashback with Malt. So Malt comes home, going to get a quick bite to eat, and he gets a sandwich full of Rorschach. Um, and Rorschach, in his typical hard-boiled way, uh, starts... Again, he seems suspicious. Perhaps Moloch was behind this, blah, 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 blah. Um, but we find out, we get all this information from Moloch about what was actually going on here. Um, by the way, fun Easter egg. Uh, if you remember Allen Ginsberg's um, poem from last year from American Literature, uh, how the idea of Moloch was used repeatedly within that poem as a symbol of, of the parts of society that are really negative. Um, so fun little Easter egg there. Let's go to the comedian. Uh, it, or I guess Moloch is describing this. Um, a week before the comedian died, he came in. Moloch calls it his last performance. And let's see, this is, this is shocking for the comedian. What does he say here? Um, he said it's a joke, solid joke. So notice it's a line he's been saying, but it seems a lot darker now. He doesn't seem happy about it. He doesn't seem confident about it. He says, I mean, let me tell you, when I started out when I was a kid cleaning up the waterfronts, it was like real easy. The world was tough. You just had to be tougher, right? Not anymore. I mean, I thought I knew how it was, how the world was. But then I found out about this gag, this joke. So let's just pause. Comedian's ideas, right? The world is tough. If you actually look at what the world is, the violent, depraved aspects of, of human nature, um, what is the reaction to it? In the comedian's mind, it is, it is to inflict violence, right? Yes, humanity um, isn't good. There is no, uh, to, to believe in the idea of goodness or compassion with humanity is to be a fool in his eyes, is to be living in a fantasy world. Um, but how do you get humans to behave? You just have to be tougher. You just have to inflict violence to keep them in line, to check their violent behavior. Um, and he says, uh, you're part of it, Moloch, old pal, you know that? If, if I thought you did know, I saw your name on the list, you and Janie Slater, but if I thought you were in on this, I'd kill you, you understand? Kill you. I mean, you fought that big blue geek. Okay, wait, so clearly this plot, guys, has something to do with Dr. Manhattan. I wonder what's going on. We'll have to keep reading. Uh, you know what his head's like. I tell you, who knows which way he'll jump if anybody messes with him. He might, he might just... Nah, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. Don't you got any booze in this place? I mean, what gets me, right? What gets me, I need never have looked out of the window of the airship at that moment, never seen the goddamn island, never got involved. Ha, there you are, some bitch. And he starts drinking, 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 and he says it stinks. It all stinks. I mean, this joke. I mean, I thought I was the comedian, you know? Oh, God, I can't believe it. I can't believe anyone would do it. I can't believe... And then he starts breaking down, crying. Um, and he says, oh, Jesus, look at me. I'm crying, you know. You don't know what's happening. On that island, they got writers, scientists, artists, and what they're doing. I mean, I'd done some bad things. I did bad things to women. I shot kids. In Nam, I shot kids. But I never did anything like, like, oh, mother. Oh, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. So note, notice also that he's right below a cross um, right here. It just happens to be coincidental, but obviously Alan Moore is doing something. This theme of forgiveness or redemption in the comedian's last moments show that even his uh, moral compass, even his nihilism doesn't go, uh, it, it isn't completely um, to the level where any action becomes permittable. There is something that has horrified even the comedian's uh, very loose sense of morals um, or his lack of morals, right? There's a line that even he wasn't aware of um, that has been crossed. What is it? We obviously don't know yet. And uh, obviously this graphic novel is about exploring that mystery. Uh, makes you want to read a little bit more. Um, and he says, what's funny? What's so goddamn funny? I don't get it. Somebody explain. Somebody explain it to me. 
So even the comedian system, which has been his value system, has been about critiquing through the use of irony primarily, um, the gap between people's values and the depraved actions of humanity, even here is broken down. Um, and so we need to understand why. What, what, what is the action that is going to horrify even the comedian's values? Um, and once we find it out, please remember uh, back to this moment that even someone as nihilistic as the comedian, uh, that this action ultimately broke him. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the chapter. Um, let's just see. We get a nice little Rorschach monologue again. Um, also, you know, guys, fun Easter eggs all over. Um, if you look at this uh, concert that's going on, the Enola Gay and the Little Boys, well, what is that? Um, if anybody did some Wikipedia searches, you would find out that the Enola Gay was the plane used to drop the atomic bomb over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that Little Boy um, is obviously one of the names of the atomic bombs, Little Boy and Fat Man. Um, so even, you know, there are these little clues, guys, tons of apocalyptic hints scattered throughout this novel, whether it's the end is nigh guy, the not so science guy holding his sign, whether it's the Enola Gay and the Little Boys, whether it's the pale horse poster that we saw in chapter one, which is a good symbol of the horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, whether it's Crystal Knot, which is a, a clear reference to the lead up to World War II and the Holocaust, uh, obviously some of the most apocalyptic events in, in world history. Um, so keep an eye out for those Easter eggs. And now, in case you were forgetting about Rorschach's values, we get a, uh, we get a flashback to it. Women's breast draped across every billboard, every display littering the sidewalk, was offered Swedish love and French love, but not American love. American love, like Coke and green glass bottles, they don't make it anymore. So what's Rorschach saying here? This is about his values being uh, being in the past. I think Rorschach and the comedian, we'll see this much more clearly in chapter six, I think actually share many of the starting premises about humanity, about their depravity, about their proclivity towards evil. Um, but the reaction is very different. Rorschach will believe that those moral values are in the past, they're just lost now, and that one should just readjust their moral compass to return to those past values. Whereas the comedian believes that all the values, those of the past, those of the present, those of the future, all all those are jokes. Um, thought about Moloch's story on Way to Cemetery. Could all be lies, could all be part of a revenge scheme planned during his decade behind bars. But if true, then what? Puzzling reference to an island, also to Dr. Manhattan. Might he be in risk at some way? So many questions. Never mind. Answer soon. Nothing is insoluble. Nothing is hopeless. Not while there's life. Notice Rorschach's uh, insistence always on never despairing, never giving up, always continuing to battle evil, um, even in the face of insurmount insurmountable odds. Uh, let's continue. In the cemetery, all the white crosses stood in rows, neat chalk marks on a giant scoreboard, paid last respects quietly without fuss. Edward Morgan Blake, born 1924, 45 years a comedian, died 1985, buried in the rain. Is that what happens to us? A life of conflict with no time for friends, so that when it's done, only our enemies leave roses. Violent lives, ending violently. Dollar Bill, the silhouette Captain Metropolis. We never die in bed, not allowed. Something in our personalities, perhaps, some animal urge to fight and struggle, making us what we are. Unimportant. We do what we have to do. So notice here, Rorschach again emphasizing the inner violence of humanity, very similar to Edward Blake, right? Um, and that it's he has to do what 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 people like Edward Blake and Rorschach do. They do it not because it's what one should do. It's not because there are good there's goodness within the world that one should act on. They do it because they have to, because otherwise humanity will descend into pure barbarity and evil and violence. He says others bury their heads between the swollen teats of indulgence and gratification, piglets squirming beneath a sow for shelter. But there is no shelter, and the future is bearing down like an express train. So again, similar point as, uh, as the comedian here. Most people bury their heads between the swollen teats of indulgence and gratification. Most people would like to ignore the tough realities of the world, right? And would instead try to turn to nice little distractions, whether that is the fantasy of moral clarity or whether that is um, you know, more immediate hedonistic uh, ways to distract oneself. Obviously, Rorschach agrees that the future is apocalyptic. It is bearing down like an express train, something that has immense force and power that cannot easily be stopped. And you get the uh, flashback here to the comedian burning the map, saying it's all going to blow due to the atomic detonation. Um, 
Blake understood, treated it like a joke, but he understood. He saw the cracks in society, saw the little men in masks trying to hold it together. He saw the true face of the 20th century and chose to become a reflection, a parody of it. No one else saw the joke. That's why he was lonely. So what do these lines mean? Uh, really, really important lines that I think summarize this chapter really well. Obviously, uh, when you see the little men in masks trying to hold it together, the most immediate thing you probably thought of was just the vigilantes themselves dressing up trying to fight crime. But I think it goes far beyond that. If you've understood the comedian's critique, you understood that he is not just a psychopath who is engaging in uh, sadistic actions just because he enjoys sadistic actions. Rather, he has been trying to make a point throughout this chapter. And his point applies not just to the people who are wearing costumes, even though we have seen those critiques uh, primarily throughout the chapter. Rather, it is all the people within society, all the little men um, who metaphorically are wearing masks, who refuse to leave their fantasy world of moral clarity, who continue to hold on to these notions that humanity is civil, that we are uh, capable of living together without great violence, that we are good, that we are compassionate, that we are selfless. All of those ideas are us wearing masks, right? And that if you were to, uh, if, if, if you get rid of those masks um, or, or you look closely you will see that there are cracks all throughout society, um, the depraved things that people do, the violent things people do, the selfish things people do, so on and so forth. And what is the true face of the 20th century, uh, face being a symbol or a figuratively associated with identity? Um, the 20th century, if you think about it, um, was is the point where humanity inflicted the greatest forms of destruction that we have ever seen. World War One, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam, the Holocaust, all of these uh, moments of the 20th century uh, absolutely bring to a head the notion that progress hasn't actually led to humanity being better. We haven't become... Uh, uh, we haven't become more moral or more compassionate. Um, instead, all that has changed is our capacity for destruction. Um, after something like the Holocaust, how can you believe in human goodness? It becomes immensely difficult, right? Um, and so he is becoming a reflection of the violence and depravity of the 20th century. He is a parody of the empirical evidence of humanity's depravity. If you look at human history, you will not see stories of human goodness. You will see stories of people selfishly trying to grab power and inflicting violence in the name of grabbing that power either from the, for themselves or for their nation um, and committing horrific actions. And that as history progresses, those actions only become more intensified. Um, and so the comedian is becoming a parody of it by working on behalf of the federal government and going and being sanctioned to burn uh, villages, to murder children in Vietnam, to shoot them, to shoot a pregnant woman, so on and so forth. Um, he is continually enabled and sanctioned by the U.S. federal government. He is held up as a prop, uh, as a propaganda prop by the uh, federal government, by the United States. And so all of that, he is a reflection, he is a parody of the depravity and violence of mankind. So it ends on this. Um, heard joke once, man goes to doctor, says he's depressed, says life seems harsh and cruel, says he feels all alone in a threatening world where what lies ahead is vague and uncertain. Doctor says treatment is simple. Great, great clown Pagliacci is in town tonight. Go and see him. That should pick you up. Man bursts into tears, says, but doctor, I am Pagliacci. So it ends on this note, right? The comedian's, uh, his tragic aspect of his existence is the loneliness. Nobody else is willing to escape or, or retreat from this world of moral clarity. I, I think the comedian would absolutely even critique Rorschach's sense of morals. Uh, I mean, you saw him make fun of him. He just called him a crazy person earlier. Um, and he lives this life of loneliness and isolation. And I think this makes him very similar to Grendel, right? Grendel, another character who becomes nihilistic and suffers a crushing sense of isolation due to that. Um, Good joke, everybody laugh, roll on snare drum, curtains. And you're seeing the red of the violence and the blood being paralleled in the rose here. Um, a gift at the funeral, but also a good evidence of the way in which Rorschach says their lives end violently. Um, and now if we go to the end chapter excerpt, we see all of these ideas paralleled. As Hollis Mason remembers the origin of the superheroes, you see, again, that it wasn't 
really based out of these noble or heroic intentions. They aren't things that reveal that ultimately look at how incredible humanity is. We see that their intentions for becoming heroes were actually quite dubious and that beneath um, their seemingly uh, their seemingly heroic aspects of their characters, we see that they are kind of, just like the comedian has been saying, jokes. Um, Let's go on here. You can see uh, in this third paragraph, it says there is a silk specter uh, now retired and living with her daughter after an unsuccessful early marriage who in retrospect was probably the first of us ever to realize there could be commercial benefits in being a mass adventurer. The Silk Spectre used her reputation as a crime fighter primarily to make the front pages and receive exposure for her lucrative modeling career. So if you, if you needed more evidence about the Silk Spectre's shallowness in terms of her desire to become a superhero, there it is. Uh, same with Dollar Bill, right? You can see the Dollar Bill, originally a star college athlete from Kansas who was employed as an in-house superhero by one of the major national banks when they realized that the mass man fad uh, made being able to brag about having a hero of your own to protect your customer's money a very interesting publicity prospect. Again, notice um, how the comedian would critique this. He's being hired off by a bank, not because he is really fighting uh, good versus evil, but because it is convenient and from a monetary perspective for a bank. Dollar Bill was one of the nicest and most straightforward men I've ever uh, met, and the fact he died so tragically young is something that still upsets me. While attempting to stop a raid upon one of his employer's banks, his cloak became entangled in the bank's revolving door, and he was shot dead at point-blank range before he could free it. Designers employed by the bank had designed his costume for maximum publicity appeal. If he had designed it himself, he might have left out that damned stupid cloak and still be alive today. I think the cape is a great uh, metaphor for what the comedian has been saying, right? A cape is a flourish. It is an appearance. Um, it is a pretense that creates this, uh, that, creates a, that creates an appearance of uh, heroism or nobility, some, something that should be impressive, just like these people dressing up, but that beneath the surface, right, um, it ends up just getting in the way. It gets them killed. Um, and keep going, right? And you can see here, there was Mothman, the silhouette, the comedian, there was me, all of us choosing to dress up in gaudy opera costumes and express the notion of evil in simple childish terms, while in Europe, they were turning human beings into soap and lampshades. I, I think that line captures very well the comedian's critique earlier that the superheroes are childish and naive, that the real problems, uh, like human beings being turned into soap, uh, i.e. the Holocaust, are, are not capable of individuals um, just dressing up and fixing these. An individual can't solve World War II. It requires these huge forces and huge armies in which individuals are just these powerless little pawns. Um, we were sometimes respected, sometimes analyzed, most of all laughed at, and in spite of all the musings above, I don't think that those of us still surviving today are any close to any closer to understanding just why we really did it. And so he admits, right, that we that they were uh, childish, that they were something to be laughed at, which is what the comedian's argument has been all along. He says some of us did it because we were hired to and some of us did it to gain publicity. Some of us did it out of a sense of childish excitement. And some of us, I think, did it for a kind of excitement that was altogether more adult, if perhaps less healthy. He's referring here to like sexual fetishes. They called us fascists, and they called us perverts, and while there's an element of truth in both those accusations, neither of them are big enough to take in the whole picture. And look at the evidence he presents here. Now, obviously, Hollis Mason is still going to try to affirm um, their their efforts, but I don't think he, he, he presents enough evidence to say that what they did was good, but he presents certainly enough evidence to show the ways in which we should laugh at them. Um, he says some of them were politically extreme. We find out Hooded Justice supports Hitler's Third Reich, Rout Row, and that Captain Metropolis was racist towards Black and Hispanic Americans. Uh-oh, another rut row. He says, I dare say some of us had our sexual hangups. Um, and so we find out that there's some weird fetishes going on in terms of this. He says some of us were unstable and erotic. A mothman had been committed to a mental institution for alcoholism and having a mental breakdown. And he says we were, kink we were crazy, we were kinky, we were Nazis, all those things people say. We were also doing something because we believed in it. We were attempting through our personal efforts to make our country a safer and better place to live in. So notice, right, the comedian would clearly critique those last lines, that the evidence here points to the ways in which we should be laughing at them. They are a joke with, with shallow values, with bad intentions, um, and that their attempts to team up and to fight evil is something to be laughed at. 
Um, and this goes through the origin story of them getting together, which is linked again to uh, Sally Jupiter's agent trying to get them together for publicity. And we see by the end, um, all of them, the Minuteman being finished, uh, whoops, the Minuteman being finished and, um, and he says, eventually there was just me, Mothman, Hooded Justice, and Captain Metropolis sitting around in a meeting hall that smelled like a locker room now that there weren't any women in the room, a group. There wasn't nobody interested left to fight, nothing notable to talk about. In 1949, we called it a day. So the entire history of the Minuteman seems laughable. Um, so chapter two, there we go. Uh, pretty interesting. Hopefully you understand a little bit better what the comedian is going for. Um, hopefully you understand why he is not – to say that he is just a psychopath for the sake of being a psychopath is too simplistic and that really he is making deeper points about the um, shallowness or superficiality of human values, especially moral values.